Welcome to our Wednesday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm teaching verse by verse through the book of Hebrews. We're now into Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 8. And as I've said on my programs this week, this is some of the most radical things in the Bible, things that are completely contrary to 99.9% of what Christianity is teaching. And because of it, most New Testament Christians haven't fully enjoyed the benefits of what Jesus purchased for us because they haven't learned these truths. So once again, I'd like to encourage you to please go over the teaching that I'm doing this week from Hebrews chapter 9 and even into next week, Hebrews chapter 10. You've got to learn these things to fully appreciate what Jesus did for us. And so you can go to our website and you can watch archived copies of all of these programs, or you can get this brand new book. This is my living commentary. This is a digital commentary that I've been teaching from, and it is a powerful tool. But we have taken the portion of this digital commentary, and we've printed out the footnotes on the book of Hebrews. This is a brand new hardback uh, copy of that. First time we've ever offered this book. We're asking for a donation of any amount for that. And then we have CDs and DVDs and a USB that will go into more detail. And again, this is just so critical that you get hold of these truths. And these are truths that most people haven't heard. Yesterday, I was dealing with Hebrews chapter 9, verse 5, where it says that we can't talk about the cherubims that were over the mercy seat anymore. And the reason you can't talk about them, it talked about every other part of the tabernacle had a New Testament counterpart. But in the, when it comes to the cherubims that shadowed the mercy seat, we can't talk about them because now the veil that separated us from the very presence of God is done away with through Jesus. And we have boldness to enter into the very presence of God and no cherub is ever going to stand there and hinder us from coming to God. So that's the reason that you can't talk about the cherubs anymore. This, this separation between God and man has been done away with through Jesus. Now, if you don't know Jesus, you still are separated from God. You can only get to God through Jesus. As Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. It says in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved. Muhammad can't save you. Buddha can't save you. Hare Krishna, Hare Lam can't save you. Those are all man-made ways of dealing with things. Jesus is the only way to the Father. So if you don't know Jesus personally, then you don't have access to the Father. There is still a separation between God and man. But when you make Jesus Christ your Lord, you have now had the separation between God and you removed, not only for the things that you've done in the past, but even the things that you're doing now and the things you will do in the future. You have direct access to God through Jesus' righteousness, not through your righteousness. Man, I could go back and preach all of that over again, but again, I dealt with those things in more detail on yesterday's program. Now, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 8, it says, The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. And again, if you take this in its context, it says as long as that veil was up that separated the holy place from the holy of holies where God dwelt, it was to show that there could be no direct communion between sinful man and holy God. But when Jesus died, it says in Hebrews chapter 10, that his flesh was that veil and his flesh was torn. And now we have direct access to God. But as long as that tabernacle was still standing, it was to illustrate that we don't have access to God. Did you know that there are multiple scriptures in the New Testament now that show that we are the temple of God. And so that's the reason that we don't have temples today as they did in the Old Testament because in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and also chapter 6, it says, Know ye not that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so God now dwells in us. We don't have to have a temple. We don't have to have blood sacrifices anymore. 
AND I THINK THAT MOST CHRISTIANS WATCHING THIS WOULD SAY, YES, I AGREE WITH THAT. DID YOU KNOW YOU ALSO DON'T HAVE TO HAVE THE SEPARATION BETWEEN US AND GOD THAT THE OLD TESTAMENT DEPICTED? WE NOT ONLY ARE FREED FROM HAVING TO WORSHIP GOD IN A TEMPLE, WE NOT ONLY ARE FREED FROM HAVING TO OFFER BLOOD SACRIFICES, BUT WE'RE ALSO FREED FROM THE GUILT AND THE CONDEMNATION THAT IS ATTACHED TO OUR SIN, EVEN THE SIN THAT WE HAVEN'T COMMITTED YET. AND I KNOW THAT THIS... If, MAN, I JUST PRAY THAT YOU CAN STICK WITH ME THROUGH THIS. I'M SAYING SOME RADICAL THINGS THAT I KNOW A LOT OF PEOPLE... I CAN HEAR TELEVISION SETS TURNING OFF ALL AROUND THE WORLD RIGHT NOW, BUT I'M TELLING YOU, IF YOU CAN HANG ON, I'M GOING TO SHOW YOU THIS RIGHT HERE IN THESE VERSES. SO IN VERSE 9 IT SAYS, WHICH WAS A FIGURE, TALKING ABOUT THIS TABERNACLE, WAS A FIGURE FOR THE TIME THEN PRESENT IN WHICH WERE OFFERED BOTH GIFTS AND SACRIFICES THAT COULD NOT MAKE HIM THAT DID THE SERVICE PERFECT AS PERTAINING TO THE CONSCIENCE. THIS IS GOING TO BE AMPLIFIED IN HEBREWS CHAPTER 10, VERSES 1 AND 2, TO WHERE AT THE END OF VERSE 2 IT EVEN SAYS WE SHOULD HAVE NO MORE CONSCIENCE OF SIN. THAT'S RADICAL. THE AVERAGE CHRISTIAN THINKS THAT HAVING A SIN CONSCIOUSNESS IS ACTUALLY A GOOD THING. YOU WILL HEAR PEOPLE SAY, I'M JUST AN OLD SINNER SAVED BY GRACE. AND THE EMPHASIS ON I'M AN OLD SINNER AND SAVED BY GRACE DOESN'T HAVE QUITE AS MUCH EMPHASIS AS THE FACT THAT I'M AN OLD SINNER. WELL, I WAS AN OLD SINNER, BUT I GOT SAVED BY GRACE, AND NOW I AM THE RIGHTEOUSNESS OF GOD, AND I SHOULD NOT BE EMPHASIZING THE FACT THAT I WAS AN OLD SINNER. BUT MOST PEOPLE SEE STILL WITH THEIR CONSCIENCE ARE FEELING SEPARATED FROM GOD. EVEN THOUGH THE ATONEMENT HAS BEEN MADE AND THERE IS ZERO REJECTION, THERE IS ZERO RESISTANCE ON GOD'S PART, WE STILL HAVE A DEFILED CONSCIENCE. YOU KNOW, I'VE GOT A BOOK ENTITLED, WHO TOLD YOU THAT YOU WERE NAKED? AND THAT'S A QUOTATION FROM GENESIS CHAPTER 3, VERSE 11, WHERE THE LORD CALLED OUT TO ADAM AND SAID, ADAM, WHERE ARE YOU? AND ADAM SAID, I WAS AFRAID, AND I HID MYSELF BECAUSE I WAS NAKED. AND GOD SAID, WHO TOLD YOU THAT YOU WERE NAKED? IT'S OBVIOUS FROM THAT QUESTION THAT GOD DIDN'T TELL HIM HE WAS NAKED. THERE IS NO INDICATION THAT THE DEVIL TOLD HIM HE WAS NAKED. YOU KNOW WHO TOLD HIM HE WAS NAKED? HIS OWN CONSCIENCE. WHEN HE ate OF THE TREE OF THE KNOWLEDGE, OF GOOD AND EVIL. THAT IS DESCRIPTIVE OF WHAT THE CONSCIENCE DOES. ROMANS CHAPTER 2, VERSE 15 SAYS THEIR CONSCIENCE IS EITHER CONDEMNING THEM OR EXCUSING THEM OR ACCUSING THEM. ONE OF THE TWO. THAT'S WHAT THE CONSCIENCE DOES. AND WHEN ADAM AND EVE ate OF THE TREE OF THE KNOWLEDGE OF GOOD AND EVIL IS WHERE THEIR CONSCIENCE CAME ALIVE AND THEIR OWN CONSCIENCE CONDEMNED THEM. NOW JESUS HAS MADE AN ATONEMENT, BUT THIS SAYS THAT THEY ARE STILL NOT PURGED ACCORDING TO uh, THEIR CONSCIENCE. THEIR CONSCIENCE IS STILL DEFILED. UNDER THE OLD TESTAMENT, THE OLD TESTAMENT ANIMAL SACRIFICES COULD NEVER TAKE AWAY SINS. THEY WERE ONLY SYMBOLIC, AND SYMBOLISM COULD NOT ACTUALLY CLEANSE US IN OUR CONSCIENCE. THAT'S WHAT THIS IS REFERRING TO. IN VERSE 10, IT SAYS, TALKING ABOUT THIS OLD TESTAMENT WAY OF APPROACHING UNTO GOD THROUGH THE LAW, IT STOOD ONLY IN MEATS, AND DRINKS, AND DIVERS, WASHINGS, AND CARNAL ORDINANCES IMPOSED UPON THEM UNTIL THE TIME OF REFORMATION. THIS VERY VERSE SHOWS YOU THAT THE OLD TESTAMENT LAW AND THE SEPARATION THAT IT PRODUCED BETWEEN GOD AND MAN WAS ONLY TEMPORARY UNTIL JESUS COULD COME AND REDEEM US AND TAKE AWAY THESE CHERUBS THAT WOULD STOP US FROM APPROACHING GOD, AND NOW WE HAVE BOLDNESS TO ENTER INTO THE VERY PRESENCE OF GOD. AND LOOK AT THIS LAST PHRASE. IT SAYS, THESE THINGS WERE IMPOSED UPON THEM UNTIL THE TIME OF REFORMATION, SHOWING YOU THAT THERE WAS GOING TO BE AN END TO THIS. WE DON'T APPROACH GOD THE WAY THE OLD TESTAMENT PEOPLE DID. LET ME REPHRASE THAT. WE SHOULD NOT APPROACH GOD THE WAY THE OLD TESTAMENT PEOPLE DID, AND YET THE AVERAGE CHRISTIAN TODAY IS STILL GOT THIS SIN CONSCIOUSNESS THAT IS SEPARATING THEM FROM ENJOYING THE TRUE BENEFITS AND BLESSINGS THAT JESUS PURCHASED FOR US. IT WAS ONLY IMPOSED ON THEM UNTIL. THAT MEANS IT WAS TEMPORARY. YOU CAN READ OVER IN GALATIANS CHAPTER 3, AND IT SAYS THAT THE LAW WAS OUR SCHOOLMASTER, AND IT WAS ONLY UNTIL GRACE SHOULD COME, UNTIL FAITH COULD COME. AND SAD TO SAY, THE AVERAGE NEW TESTAMENT CHRISTIAN IS LIVING LIKE AN OLD TESTAMENT SAINT, NOT FULLY ENJOYING THE BENEFITS THAT JESUS PURCHASED FOR US. AND IT SAYS IT WAS IMPOSED UPON US UNTIL THE TIME OF REFORMATION. THE WORD REFORMATION HERE, HERE'S WHAT IT LITERALLY MEANS. IT MEANS TO STRAIGHTEN 
THOROUGHLY. THAT'S WHAT THE STRONG'S CONCORDANCE SAYS. SO WHEN IT SAYS IT WAS IMPOSED UPON US UNTIL THE TIME THAT THINGS COULD BE STRAIGHTENED OUT. AND LOOK AT THESE VERSES, ISAIAH CHAPTER 40, VERSES 3 THROUGH 5. THIS WAS TALKING ABOUT uh, JOHN THE BAPTIST COMING AND WHAT HIS MINISTRY WOULD BE LIKE. AND IT SAYS, THE VOICE OF HIM THAT CRIETH IN THE WILDERNESS, PREPARE YE THE WAY OF THE LORD, MAKE STRAIGHT IN THE DESERT A HIGHWAY FOR OUR GOD. EVERY VALLEY SHALL BE EXALTED, AND EVERY MOUNTAIN AND HILL SHALL BE MADE LOW, AND THE CROOKED SHALL BE MADE STRAIGHT, AND THE ROUGH PLACES PLAIN, AND THE GLORY OF THE LORD SHALL BE REVEALED, AND ALL FLESH SHALL SEE IT TOGETHER, FOR THE MOUTH OF THE LORD HAS SPOKEN IT. DID YOU KNOW THAT THIS WAS QUOTED IN LUKE CHAPTER 3, TALKING ABOUT JOHN THE BAPTIST, AND IT SAYS IN LUKE 3, 3, IT SAYS, HE CAME INTO ALL THE COUNTRY ABOUT JORDAN PREACHING THE BAPTISM OF REPENTANCE, FOR THE REMISSION OF SINS, AS IT IS WRITTEN IN THE BOOK OF THE WORDS OF ISAIAH THE PROPHET, SAYING, THE VOICE OF ONE CRYING IN THE WILDERNESS, PREPARE YE THE WAY OF THE LORD, MAKE HIS PATH STRAIGHT. EVERY VALLEY SHALL BE FILLED, AND EVERY MOUNTAIN AND HILL SHALL BE BROUGHT LOW, AND THE CROOKED SHALL BE MADE STRAIGHT, AND THE ROUGH PLACES SHALL BE MADE PLAIN, AND ALL FLESH SHALL SEE THE SALVATION OF GOD. SO HERE'S TWO PASSAGES OF SCRIPTURE, THE OLD TESTAMENT AND THEN THE NEW TESTAMENT PASSAGE WHERE IT SAYS THAT WHEN JESUS CAME, HE WOULD MAKE STRAIGHT THE THING THAT HAD BEEN CROOKED. AND THAT'S EXACTLY WHAT THE WORD REFORMATION MEANS, TO STRAIGHTEN THOROUGHLY. SO PUTTING ALL THIS TOGETHER, I BELIEVE THAT THE OLD TESTAMENT WAS NOT A DIRECT PATH TO GOD. It, YOU HAD TO GO THROUGH ALL OF THESE RITUALS THAT SYMBOLIZED WHAT JESUS WAS GOING TO DO. AND THERE WAS THE CROOKED. IT WAS CROOKED, A WAY THAT uh, APPROACHED GOD. BUT NOW THROUGH JESUS, WE HAVE A DIRECT PATH TO GOD WITHOUT ANY FEAR OF PUNISHMENT. AGAIN, I WANT TO EMPHASIZE THAT THIS IS TALKING ABOUT THOSE WHO'VE ACCEPTED JESUS. IF YOU HAVEN'T ACCEPTED JESUS, IF ALL YOU'VE DONE IS ACKNOWLEDGE THAT HE EXISTS, YOU MAY EVEN ACKNOWLEDGE THAT HE WAS A GREAT PERSON, BUT IF YOU HAVEN'T COMMITTED YOUR LIFE LIKE IT SAYS IN ROMANS CHAPTER 10, VERSE 9, IF YOU CONFESS WITH YOUR MOUTH THE LORD JESUS AND BELIEVE IN YOUR HEART THAT GOD RAISED HIM FROM THE DEAD, YOU SHALL BE SAVED. YOU'VE GOT TO COMMIT YOUR LIFE TO JESUS AS BEING YOUR LORD, MORE THAN JUST ACKNOWLEDGE HIM. IT SAYS OVER IN JAMES CHAPTER 2, YOU BELIEVE THAT THERE'S ONE GOD, YOU DO WELL. THE DEVILS ALSO BELIEVE AND TREMBLE. BUT WON'T YOU KNOW, O VAIN MAN, THAT FAITH WITHOUT WORKS IS DEAD. IF ALL YOU'VE DONE IS JUST ACKNOWLEDGE THAT THERE IS A GOD, AND YOU MAY EVEN ACKNOWLEDGE THAT JESUS WAS THE SON OF GOD, BUT IF YOU HAVEN'T COMMITTED YOUR LIFE UNTO HIM, WELL, THEN you, YOU'LL SPLIT HELL WIDE OPEN. BUT ONCE YOU MAKE JESUS YOUR LORD, ONCE YOU CONFESS WITH YOUR MOUTH THAT JESUS IS YOUR LORD, YOU NOW HAVE THE VEIL OF THE TEMPLE BROKEN. THE BODY OF JESUS WAS BROKEN FOR YOU, AND YOU HAVE DIRECT ACCESS INTO THE PRESENCE OF GOD WITHOUT ANY FEAR OF REBUKE. I DON'T CARE WHAT YOU'VE DONE OR HAVEN'T DONE. YOU APPROACH HIM BASED ON WHAT JESUS DID, NOT ON WHAT YOU DO. NOW WE HAVE A STRAIGHT PATH TO RELATIONSHIP WITH GOD. MAN, THAT'S AWESOME. IN VERSE 11, IT SAYS, BUT CHRIST BEING COME, A HIGH PRIEST OF GOOD THINGS TO COME BY A GREATER AND A MORE PERFECT TABERNACLE, NOT MADE WITH HANDS, THAT IS TO SAY, NOT OF THIS BUILDING. IN OTHER WORDS, TALKING ABOUT THE OLD TESTAMENT TABERNACLE WAS MADE WITH HANDS. IT WAS SOMETHING THAT MEN BUILT, BUT IT WAS ONLY A PICTURE OF THE TRUE TABERNACLE, THE TRUE TEMPLE THAT'S IN HEAVEN. AND JESUS IS NOW OUR HIGH PRIEST, AND HE DIDN'T ENTER INTO JUST THE PHYSICAL TEMPLE THAT WAS HERE ON THIS EARTH. HE ENTERED INTO HEAVEN ITSELF AND APPLIED HIS BLOOD ON THE MERCY SEAT THAT IS IN THE TEMPLE IN HEAVEN. AND IN VERSE 12, MAN, THIS IS... ONE AWESOME VERSE RIGHT HERE. AND I JUST PRAY THAT THE LORD OPENS UP YOUR HEART AND THAT YOU DON'T CHOKE ON THIS AGAIN. I KNOW THAT THIS IS SO CONTRARY TO WHAT ALL OF US HAVE BEEN TAUGHT, BUT THAT DOESN'T MEAN THAT IT'S WRONG. I'M READING TO YOU FROM SCRIPTURE. HEBREWS CHAPTER 9, VERSE 12 SAYS, NEITHER BY THE BLOOD OF GOATS AND CALVES, BUT BY HIS OWN BLOOD, HE, SPEAKING OF JESUS, ENTERED IN ONCE INTO THE HOLY PLACE HAVING OBTAINED ETERNAL REDEMPTION FOR US. AGAIN, IF YOU TAKE THIS ALL IN ITS CONTEXT, IT'S CONTRASTING THE WAY IN THE OLD COVENANT WAS CROOKED. YOU HAD TO GO THROUGH ALL THESE SACRIFICES. YOU COULD NOT HAVE DIRECT ACCESS TO GOD BECAUSE OUR SIN SEPARATED US FROM GOD. 
But in the new covenant, there is now a time of reformation that has been made straight, and the veil of the temple, the flesh of Jesus, has been rent in two for us, and we can now enter into the very presence of God without any fear of punishment. Our sin and all of its punishment was placed upon Jesus. There isn't any punishment left for you if you've made Jesus your personal Lord. Now, if you try and enter into the presence of God without Jesus, if you try and enter on your own goodness, I guarantee you nobody can stand in the presence of God based on your own goodness. But if you have truly made Jesus your Lord, the veil of the temple, His flesh has been rent. You can come boldly into the very presence of God. He, he took His blood and entered into the temple in heaven and reconciled the sins of the entire world unto Him. First John chapter 2, verse 2 says, He is the propitiation, that means the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Now, some people will teach that and say, yes, that's true for all of the sins that you've already committed. And when you get born again, God wipes away all of your past, and you are now completely forgiven. But then, once you're born again, every sin that you commit is a new transgression against God, and you've got to get that sin confessed and under the blood, and Jesus has to reapply His blood to you. So some Christians will preach that, yes, your sins in the past are all forgiven, but the current sins, the sins that you're going to commit in the future, each one of those have to be dealt with individually and repented of individually. That's not what this verse is saying. Look at this again. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once. And this word once is going to be used four other times. The word once means upon one occasion only. On one occasion only. It's not just uh, something that happened and then has to be repeated. This is something that is never repeated. Upon one occasion only, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Again, did you know that the average Christian only believes that our sins have been paid for partially? And that every time we sin, we have to go and again repent and get Jesus to forgive that sin all over again. Now, there's two extremes on this. The ultra-Pentecostals actually believe that every time you sin as a Christian, that you have to come and be born again, but then even after you're born again and after you make Jesus your personal Savior, every time you sin, that is something that separates you from God again. They will call it being backslid. And if you were to, like, have a car wreck before you could get that sin confessed, and repented of, and under the blood of Jesus, Jesus has to reapply His blood to you. And if you were to die before you got that sin confessed, you would go to hell because that sin wasn't covered. They believe that only the sins in the past are covered, and then every time you commit sin as a Christian, you got to get that confessed and under the blood. And if you were to die before you did that, you would die and go to hell, even though you could have been born again for 20 or 30 years. Any unconfessed sin would separate you from God. And then the evangelicals, it's really the same thing. It's just a lesser penalty. Instead of being dying and going to hell if you have an unconfessed sin in your life, they will teach that if you have any unconfessed sin in your life, then God won't bless you. God won't answer your prayer. He, you won't have joy and peace. And that God, in a sense, just turns off the spigot. Now, if you were to die in that state, the evangelicals won't say that you'll go to hell, but you aren't going to be able to enjoy any of the benefits. It's like having a stick that has two opposite ends, but it's the same stick. In other words, God is still imputing sin unto you. And I've already quoted that verse out of Romans chapter 4 that says, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Not only did not, but will not. And it says over in Romans chapter 5, that, uh, that before the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Once you get born again, you are redeemed from the law, and God is not imputing sin unto you. This says that He entered in once, one time only, and obtained eternal 
redemption. What part of the word eternal do you not understand? The word eternal, the Greek word, literally means perpetual. It means that it's just, there's no end to it. He obtained eternal redemption, and yet there are segments of the body of Christ that'll teach, no, you're only redeemed partially until the next time you sin, and then you got to get born again again. Or you have to repent and get back into fellowship with God and all these kind of things. This is saying that by one offering, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Now, I know that there's people that have a question and they're saying, well, what about 1 John 1, 9, where it says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I've got an answer for that, and that fits perfectly with what we're talking about right here, but I just don't have time on our program today to explain this. So I'm going to continue to go through Hebrews chapter 9, and there are four other times that he's making this point. I won't have time to do all of that on today's program, but through the rest of this week, I'm just going to be saying this over and over exactly the way the writer of Hebrews said it over and over to make this point. And we're going to try and be drilling it home that Jesus obtained eternal redemption for you by one offering. And I know that there's probably people think, well, how could God forgive a sin before I commit it? You better pray that he can forgive a sin before you commit it because he only died for your sin one time 2,000 years ago before you were ever born, before you had ever committed a sin. If God can't forgive a sin before you commit it, well, then you and I can't be forgiven because Jesus died 2,000 years ago before we existed. Yes, God can forgive all sin, past, present, and even future sin. God has dealt with it. And I know that this raises questions, are you just saying that we can go live in sin? No, that's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that God dealt with all of your sin, past, present, and future. I'm out of time today, and I'll have to continue this tomorrow. Again, I encourage you to please go to our website. You can watch all of these archive programs where I explain this without being broken into little 30-minute segments. You can also get this brand new book. It's a 200-plus page hardback uh, book that is actually my living commentary, this digital commentary, and we printed out the portion that deals with the book of Hebrews. This would be awesome for you to study. I've got references in here. This is just a tremendous study tool. We are asking for a gift of some amount for this. We're going to put out tens of thousands of these, and if nobody gave, we simply couldn't do that. So please give whatever you can. I promise you this will be a blessing. And then we have CDs, DVDs, and a USB with both the audio and video on it. So listen to our announcer, and please call or write today.